All right, maybe we should start slowly. So I am pleased to have you here, Ahis uh, Atanasolis from the University of Dundee. And uh, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's a pleasure to be here. Let me thank the organizers for the kind invitation. It's it's a really, really interesting uh, workshop. So I'm going to talk about the Landau-Albert bifurcation. So the point is there exists a bifurcation in the cubic NLS uh, that maybe uh, many of you haven't uh, interact, haven't seen before. So and I'm going to convince you that there, this thing exists and it's relevant for Metocean data, for real life ocean waves. And also it shows a way in which open questions in Landau dumping are related to open questions in modulation instability and things that we recognize more familiar as NLS. So give me, allow me first to, to spend a handful of slides to explain the physical context a little bit. So the NLS, as people know, does appear in ocean waves as an envelope equation. So if we are thinking of a 1D situation, so waves are propagating in one direction, where X is in space along the direction of propagation. And we have the sea surface elevation is eta of xt, obviously it's real valued, but you can describe it through a complex valued envelope, which usually would be on a frame of reference that travels with the wave. So that's what this plane wave does there with the central wave number of the wave in any case. And then it is well known that if you do some asymptotics, the envelope to leading order satisfies a cubic NLS equation, and you have some coefficients here that have to do so G's acceleration of gravity, and K0 is a typical wave number that appears in this wave packet that you're trying to study. So the K is a small number in the sense usually it would be closer to 0 0.01 or 0 0.1 or something like that. Higher wave numbers are not very interesting, um, but the important thing to note here is that the order parameter is slow. So why is that relevant? When we hear, you know, weakly nonlinear asymptotics, it's reasonable to assume that we are talking about infinitesimally small waves, but this is not the case. What is assumed to be small in this expansion is the slope of the waves. And in real ocean waves, the slope never gets above 0 0.13 because at 0 0.13, the wave breaks anyway. So, and this is a second order expansion. So in fact, the NLS can credibly describe large waves, the waves that carry energy that are dangerous, at least for short time scales, if you want to see how the wave goes over a few wave periods, this is a credible model. So this is not something about infinitesimal small waves. And of course there are more sophisticated models like the DISTA equation, the Trulsen, or also called modified NLS equations, a Harov equation, Etc. So there are some limitations. This is 1D, this is narrow band, these are the key limitations. But as long as you have 1D narrow band wave systems, in fact, all these other models are known to be very similar to this. So what I'm trying to say here is this cubic NLS is a credible, is a viable model for 1D waves, maybe under some assumptions, but which are often satisfied. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about 1D cubic NLS. And for this coefficient here, P and Q, we know that P is large and Q is small. So this is weakly nonlinear 1D cubic NLS. And at this point, it's fair if you say, we know everything about this. There is nothing new and nothing interesting happening here. Happening here. We know everything about this. And, and so my first order of business is to explain why this is not exactly the case. So there are. Obviously, there is a panoply of very powerful and very beautiful mathematical techniques, three hulls estimates, inverse scattering transforms, and so on, that work with cubic NLS. But all of these techniques need some assumptions about what kind of wave functions we are working with. So the message here is that, that there is an opportunity in the, in the ocean waves problem. There are new mathematical problems. If we look at the kinds of wave functions, that are considered natural and interesting in the ocean wave problem, which break our usual assumption. We have to go with other methods. So let me make this more precise. I'm putting here, this is a, a very popular, very well-known textbook of ocean waves. Every ocean engineer knows cubic NLS 
is an approximate model for ocean waves. And every ocean engineer knows the statistical theory, the linear statistical theory of ocean waves uh, just as well. And these are just two very well-known textbooks, which says what? So the sea state is locally a stationary and homogeneous random process characterized by its power spectrum. So if I take, if I'm on the field in a place in the North Atlantic and I'm trying to measure this autocorrelation of the sea surface elevation between two positions, and I'm taking some measurements, I'm doing some averaging, I come back with an autocorrelation, and if I take a Fourier transform, it's a power spectrum. What do I mean that the sea state is stationary and homogeneous? Of course, it's not forever stationary and homogeneous. It means that if you take a measurement here now, if you go four miles to the north in the middle of the ocean and 20 minutes later, you are going to find basically the same power spectrum. So in a time scale of several dozens at least, or even hundreds of wave periods, you can assume that the power spectrum is the same. And the vast majority of data that people have about ocean waves are not measurements of the of the sea surface, this is far too noisy, are measurements of this power spectrum. So oh, the data that people work with are this power spectra. And the interesting wave functions to consider from the realistic point of view, if you're trying to say something about ships and stability and, and anything that has to do with the actual real life ocean, would be something like a typical realization of a stationary random process with a known power spectrum, which is not an LP function, for example, and which is not have a constant amplitude at infinity. It, it has a near constant, it has a bound, you know, on average, it, it goes somewhere, but it's not exactly constant. So let me just highlight this point a little bit. These are some screenshots from papers where they, they work out the stability criteria that the state of the air stability criteria that the International Maritime Organization uses for uh, capsize uh, instability. So they want to understand in a given sea state, if this ship is going to travel in this kind of region, where we know these sea states uh, appear, how likely can we put an, an upper bound on the likelihood that a wave hits it from the side such that makes it roll over? And they compute that and they compute Okay, what is the wave that would make that would make it roll over? They know how to go for that, and what is the probability that this wave appears? And they compute it only with linear theory. So if we go back, sorry, not here. If we go, if we go back here, if you need to choose, do I want to have nonlinearity in my computations and use NLS, or do I want to for, forfeit nonlinearity and simply do? A Gaussian random process with this power spectrum and work with that and work with the probabilities. Engineers know always you go with the data, you go with a probabilistic approach and the measured data, and you never mind the instability. You don't put it because it's very important to have the real data. And of course, they compare their findings with CFD, with experiments in tanks, and with what happens in real life. And 99% of the time, they get it basically right they get it exactly where they want to be they don't want to over engineer either they, they get it right so by the end of this talk i my ambition is to be able to uh, to say that i explained i presented the quantitative argument why in fact this is more like 99.8 percent of the time so we can estimate that but there are interesting dangerous nonlinear things happening that we as NLS researchers can say something about that are not simply in the linear theory, but we need to use the correct kind of wave functions. Okay, so just, just a, a last slide about the real life problem, just to help give the context properly. Uh, of course, I'm talking about rock waves. This is what happens something like 0.2% of the time. And so MV Darby was a large state of the art uh, British cargo ship, it was relatively new. It was lost at C1980 without even being able to send an SOS. And many years later, they did an expensive underwater survey. And many years even after that, they published the explanation for the sinking. Now, the point here was the CP company was saying for such a large and modern ship to be lost without even having the chance to send an SOS, it clearly is the crew's fault. And if it is a cruise fault, there are no, uh, there are no um, 
compensation, there's no compensation for the for the crew, for the family members that for the crew that was lost. So 20 years later, uh, a naval architect professor from Strathclyde determined that the most likely explanation by studying the wreck in the ocean floor was impact of a single wave, which was considered unthinkable. Uh, so you have things like this and you have things like this. I'm assuming a lot of you have seen this. This is the recording from the Dropner oil platform, 1st January 1995. By the standard calculations that I showed before that engineers estimate things and build platforms and ships, this should be one in 10,000 to 40,000 year event, depending how you, you cook your numbers. So we really shouldn't have a recording of this and we definitely shouldn't have a dozen recordings of things like that that we do have. So this should be, if linear statistics was all there is to it, this should never happen or in any case, almost never happen. Uh, but it happens a few times per year and by now we have a good record of this. So something else is going on. Something else kicks in sometimes. And this is the nonlinear effect that we are trying to understand. Uh, but again, respectfully, if we look at this, we need to respect the problem. I, you know, to me, it doesn't look like a peregrine solid, right? So we need to, to respect the messiness of the problem and try to go and work with that. Okay, with that said, let me finally come back to mathematics and state more clearly mathematically what, what I'm talking about. So when we say cubic NLS, uh, oftentimes people imagine NLS with boundary conditions at infinity of decay, right? So you have like an LP function is your initial condition. You have something like this, it decays at infinity. So there is nothing unstable here. You can quantify the worst possible thing that will happen in a million ways. You have scattering, you have dispersion, you have everything. You know, there is nothing unstable here. Now, a much more interesting version of it, 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 another problem with still NLS and which has more interesting features in some sense is to get an exact plane wave solution for NLS and then add a localized perturbation on top of it. And in that case, of course, you have modulation instability. And many people uh, in this workshop, Professor Biondini, Professor Manzavinos, and many other people have made great contributions in understanding modulation instability. Uh, and this is always unstable now in the sense that whatever you do, the, the, the localized perturbation initially is going to grow. There is no bifurcation there. There is no chance for stability there. This is always unstable. It's always going to grow. Now, if I may say here, as far as I know, I'm happy to be corrected. There are many fundamental questions still open about this problem. I know there was work by Patrick Zerar and Clement Gallo um, in the 2000s to try and do the study the COSI problem for general initial homogeneities in Zitkov spaces. This works for the defocusing problem and they get a relative energy bound and you can control the inhomogeneity. As far as I know, for general initial inhomogeneities, we don't know that it doesn't blow up in finite time. We don't know what is the correct norm that stays finite or, or, or whatever. So there are, as far as I know, there are still many open questions here. And so it's already it's a source of very interesting problems, but of course, it's always unstable. Now, okay, what I'm going to talk about today is Let's assume instead of a plane wave, you had a different solution, exact solution of NLS, let's assume, but which had the following property. It was homogeneous. It was stationary in time and homogeneous in space. So if you took averages, right, they, they would it, it would be messy, it would be fluctuating, but it, you would see kind of the same pattern, pattern in all positions and in all times. Imagine you had such a solution which is what a C state would be, right? Which is what a stationary homogeneous process would be. Imagine that was a solution of NLS. Now, if you put a localized perturbation on top of that, what will happen? Will it grow exponentially like modulation stability or will it disperse linearly more or less as if the, the, the background solution was not even there? So this is the problem that I want to study that I'm going to be talking about. This is the problem that is more realistic for ocean waves. And in this case, you have both stability and instability, and there is a genuine bifurcation possible. The stable case is exactly 
what people call Landau dumping in the Vlasov equations. I'm going to show the similarity and why I call it Landau dumping. So there's a stable regime, which is basically Landau dumping. And there is an unstable regime, which is basically modulation and stability. And you can pass, you can cross from one to the other. And okay, so, so this is what I'm going to be talking about now. Obviously, as I'm sure most, most of you can imagine, I don't know how to do this deterministically because I don't have a formula for such a solution and I don't have a representation for such a solution. So what I'm going to do, because also I want to follow the Metosia data, I want to do something that will use measurements from the ocean engineers and will be actually applicable in the field. I'm going to try and do it stochastically, and I'm going to try and use the power spectrum as a representation of such a solution. So, of course, I didn't prove that such a solution exists for NLS, but it's a, it's a thought experiment. If it existed and it had this power spectrum, would it be stable or unstable? So let me now, now we have all the ingredients in place um, to, to state even more precisely the mathematical problem. So the first person who did this, who started this was Albert in his PhD paper, 1978. As far as I can tell, he left academia right after that. Today it has about 240 citations. So there are a handful of groups that have been working on this, but it's not, uh, the most common thing people do in ocean waves, definitely. Uh, and the reason for that is there were many, many fundamental mathematical difficulties. So when Albert did this, it, it, it was brilliant work. In some sense, it was ahead of his time. But there were so many things that we didn't know how to do, how to move forward. And for a long time, it kind of lingered there. It's worth noting that Crawford, Safman, and UN, who are ocean engineering, um, uh, senior ocean engineers, at the time, they also did the, the same, a couple of years later, the same approach starting not from NLS, but starting from 2D Zaharo. So in principle, the whole program, what I'm saying here today, can be done in a 2D broadband setting. So the, the limitations of NLS, let's say, as an, as an envelope equations are not fundamental to this program. Uh, it will be more, it's more tedious and more complicated, but in principle, it can be done. And in this talk, I'm going to be based on, on these papers. Uh, I want to say just a couple of words about my co-authors. Gerasimos Athanasoulis is a naval architect in NDUA. Themis Sapsis is a mechanical engineer in MIT. Maria Ptastic is an applied analyst in Hiro Vat, like my applied analyst like myself. And Odin Gramstad is an industrial engineer at the DNV, which is the biggest uh, insurance company for ships. So we really try to do the mathematics, try to answer the mathematical questions the best we can, but we really try to go closer to the problem and, and do things that are relevant to the real life problem. And of course, this group uh, helps, has expertise that can help push things in that direction. Okay, so what's the Albert equation? How do you combine NLS with the power spectrum, the statistical theory of ocean waves, the linear statistical theory, right? So let's say we have an envelope equation. We have our NLS for the envelope equation. The power spectrum is a second moment. So I want to do a second moment. I want to do a moment equation to, to deal with this. So let's take second moments. So R is the autocorrelation. This is a two space, one time autocorrelation. So alpha, beta here are space variables. With double the space, we have two space variables and we're taking the autocorrelation between position A and position B, position alpha and position beta space at time t. So there is one time only. And so we create this second order object, the autocorrelation R. Now, for the linear terms, you get a linear equation for the autocorrelation, that's straightforward. For the nonlinear terms, you start with a second moment in a nonlinear equation, and you get here, you get fourth order moments. So you would have to have a hierarchy of moments and so on. Uh, unless you do some kind of closure. Now, what Albert realized, he said, okay, what are the assumptions that we use to deal, to do the linear statistical theory of ocean waves? We take the power spectrum and we say, let's assume in addition to the power spectrum that it's a Gaussian process of mean zero and circularly symmetric, which roughly means it's equally likely to be, the value is equally likely to be positive or negative, let's say, of the CSF acceleration, if you don't know anything else. So, if you take those assumptions, those exact assumptions that are used in the linear theory, then under those assumptions, you can say something about the fourth order moments. 
you have a complex SRLIS type theorem that allows you to express the fourth order moments in terms of second order moments. So by making this assumption, by doing Gaussian closure, so that's an approximation. It's a defensible approximation. I can come back later to, to, their, to how much we lose by it and what does it mean and how limiting it is. Uh, but by doing this Gaussian closure, which is definitely inspired into an excess, justified to an extent from the kind of data that we know exists in this problem, you get a closed equation in R. So you, you get, now you have just a PD in R. And the additional step that you do is this autocorrelation, we know that to leading order is stationary and homogeneous. So it depends only on the distance of the positions alpha and beta and not on exactly where they are. And in higher order, it can be, you can have some inhomogeneities. So if you plug this in wherever you have R, you get an, a closed equation for rho, the inhomogeneity, which is this one. This is what people usually call the Albert equation. And you have the autocorrelation, which is measured. You take it from your measurements, from your data, from, from the field. This is known coefficient now of this equation. And rho is in homogeneity, right? And you're trying to see how the homogeneity works. OK, so let's look a, a little bit at this. So here you have this hyperbolic Laplacian. Rho is, I'm suppressing variables for space, right? Rho is rho of alpha, beta, t. It has two space arguments and the time argument. Rho, wherever it suppresses rho of alpha, beta, t. Here you have rho of alpha, beta, t. Here you have these uh, funny terms, rho of alpha, alpha, rho, beta, beta. I'll come back to that. They introduce substantial difficulties. Uh, and it kind of tries to be like a Schrodinger equation a little bit. So this part, the algebra works like Schrodinger, although it's not sign definite. But this part is a bit different. So OK, what do we want to do with it? So that's the equation. What, what are we trying to do with it? So the first thing we're going to do is to build a well posedness framework. We want to understand, can we guarantee uniqueness? Uh, can we guarantee propagation of smoothness? Can we guarantee that if it starts, if the solution starts reasonably localized, it stays reasonably localized, so it grows in a bounded way, let's say, um, its spatial extent? Can we guarantee smoothness in time? So these are all things that you need in order even to do numerics, right? You, you, you would like to know this. There was absolutely nothing in the literature about this type of equation. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about this, what existed in the literature, but nothing that applied to the Albert equation. And of course, that's from a mathematical point of view. From the applied point of view, the ocean engineers, their question is, is the inhomogeneity row growing or not growing? If it's growing, you have instability. If the inhomogeneity is guaranteed to not grow, or even better, disperses, then you have stability, right? And that's the landau albert bifurcation. It turns out the answer to growing or not growing depends only on the autocorrelation gamma, not on the initial data. And that's very fortunate because we don't know the initial homogeneity. We wouldn't be able to do something about the initial data. And this is, this is the bifurcation that I'm talking about. So once we have some well poisonous and we understand well stability versus instability, what we went on and did it was to apply this analysis to large Metosian data sets and really bring it up to speed with the state of the art in, in, in ocean engineering. And then try to say something more about what happens in the stable and unstable cases, because a criticism, uh, I think a valid criticism that ocean engineers had for this equation was, we don't just want a binary characterization. So are all stable states the same? And are all unstable states the same? Because they know empirically all stable states are not the same. So simply a label stable and unstable is not enough, but it turns out we can say much more by using this analysis. So. The paper by Albert 1978 formally set up a version of this uh, stability analysis. So he constructed under the instability condition, he constructed the growing modes, uh, which is fantastic, obviously, but there was absolutely nothing on stability. It was the assumption that if the instability condition does not hold, then you have stability, but there was nothing proved on that. So almost all the mathematical results I'm going to be talking now are in this paper with. Um, 
Athanasul starting a subsist in kinetic and related models in 2020. Okay, so let me let me just make sure I have mentioned some things in terms of terminology that it's clear what I'm talking about in the following slides when it's, I'm going to be doing some more work. So gamma is the autocorrelation. If you take the Fourier transform of gamma, it's a power spectrum P. I'm going to be using these terms a lot. And this is what you get from the field. This is data, this is measured. How large are the waves in the C state that we are examining is controlled by gamma of zero or equivalently the integral of the power spectrum. So th this controls if you have, if you are talking about a storm or if you are talking about a, a very calm sea. Uh, but this is not the main thing that controls stability or instability. It is one of the things that comes to play, but not the main. Now, this object here. N of alpha t, which I define to be just simply rho of alpha alpha t. I'm going to be calling position density using some uh, Wigner equations terminology. So what this does, what this means physically, is how large is at position alpha and time t the inhomogeneity, the deviation from the homogeneous background, right? And this problem has this feature that is driven by the position density. So you have a 2D problem here in the alpha beta plane. But what happens at point alpha beta in the alpha beta plane also depends on point alpha alpha in the alpha beta plane and on point beta beta in the alpha beta plane. So you have this kind of non locality that is going to be a complication. And here, this, these are traces essentially, right? You have your unknown function rho, and here you're going to take a trace of it along the diagonal. In the plane. And in other formulations, it shows up uh, a bit differently, but you always have this kind of complications. Okay, so at this point, it's necessary to present a couple of different formulations of the Albert equation because it's not clear that working in this formulation is necessarily the cleanest thing to do. Like I said, this is like a strange Schrödinger equation. You can try to use Schrödinger type techniques. Uh, but not really, they don't really work. I must mention here for the defocusing case, there is a paper by Chen Hong and Pavlovich where they use three hard estimates type of uh, approach to work with an equation for a particular gamma that comes up in material science. They call it the infinite system of fermions, but it's the same equation with defocusing, with the other sign over there. So for defocusing, you can pretend it's trending. And you can work with Schrodinger and you can get global existence in time. Uh, and that's fantastic. But for focusing, um, it's not clear how much, how far you can go with that. So one way forward from this is if you rotate, you, have, you are on your alpha beta plane, you take a rotation in your alpha beta plane. So you have now two new spatial variables. And now you take Fourier transform in one of the two new spatial variables. So you end up with two new variables, one is position X and the other is a Fourier dual of position, so it's wave number K. So this is a Wigner equation for if you are familiar with that. So another way to think of Wigner equations is it's a strange kind of class of equations, it's a quantized class of equations. So this is the free space of kinetic equations. So this piece just a number, just a coefficient. So K times derivative in X, that's exactly the free space of class of Boltzmann and so on. And here, if, if this difference, if you divide by y and multiply by y, you, you can see an analogy to Vlasov. So it's like a quantized Vlasov. The problem is it's a Vlasov with an interaction kernel of delta. Even if you pretend it's a Vlasov, it has an interaction kernel of delta. So it's a very, very bad Vlasov equation even, and not even that. So that's a strange Vlasov equation. This formulation makes it easiest to see formally the analogies, let's say, with Landau dumping in plastic equations and so on. It turns out it's not, at least for us, this is not the best formulation to actually work on. But this shows the connection. And this, of course, is a very well-known pathway for how Schrodinger or, or this type of equations, which you can call von Neumann equations in the linear case, right, uh, are related to kinetic equations. But the formulation that we were able to work with and get this results I'm, I'm presenting today is we take one more Fourier transform. So the little x, we take Fourier transform. So we go to formulation with 
where the two independent variables, the, the two spatial variables, the two wave number variables are capital X and little k. They're both wave number variables. We call the inhomogeneity F in this setting. So the unknown function is F. And we still have the position density and the position density, well, technically, okay, technically this is the position density and this is the inverse Fourier transform of the position density since we took inverse Fourier transform in X. I'm just going to be calling it also position density just to save on words. And it is a marginal of F. So before it was a trace, now it is a marginal. So it's something that wants to make our life a little bit harder when we're trying to do analysis. And so we have this formulation that we're going to work on. And this one name you can give it is Albert Fourier equation because we took Fourier transform in both variables. So from space space, we went to wave number, wave number. Okay, however you call it now, F is in homogeneity. Because we took the Fourier transform, we no longer have gamma, the autocorrelation, but P, the power spectrum. So this is the known power spectrum. And, and, and this is it. So let's look very briefly what are the terms trying to do. So this is free space. This is what would happen if you had the inhomogeneity and there was no background spectrum and no nonlinear, no nonlinearity. What would happen is the energy at wave number K would travel with a group velocity of wave number K. This is free space. That's what I call free space. Now you have a linear term, which is the interaction of your inhomogeneity with the power spectrum through the position density. So again, position density is a marginal of the unknown function F. And this is how it interacts with the power spectrum. This is what's going to decide if the power spectrum is feeding energy into the inhomogeneity or not. This is the term that controls stability. And of course, you have the self-interaction, the position density interacts with the inhomogeneity itself. And, and this is a nonlinear term, which if you start with a small inhomogeneity, okay, you have the epsilon here to remind you this is a higher order term. Okay, so now we're going to start, first of all, by trying to analyze this. So what is a correct setting? What are correct norms to work with this kind of equation? So, okay, I mentioned for us, this formulation works best. Okay, so how do we proceed? So we build the propagator for free space, which in this formulation is simply multiplication by a phase. That's straightforward. And you take the mild form. So you're saying my solution, my homogeneity F at time T is, well, the propagator applied to the initial data, so the free space evolution. And then you have to add the Duhamel term, which is an integral in time of the propagator acting on the linear and the nonlinear terms. Now, if we just so choose to take L1 norms here, uh, it, because these terms are, uh, are relatively simple by taking the L1 norms, you can, they go inside and you, you can bound the L1 norm of your solution in terms of the L1 norms of elementary building blocks, the power spectrum, the position density, the homogeneity itself, which is a function of XK of two wave number variables and the position density which is a function of capital X alone. And then why do we want L1? Because the L1 norm of the position density, the L1 norm of the marginal is controlled by the L1 norm of the function itself. So it's very, I mean, once you see it, it's like really, really simple. Once you go there with this re really simple idea, we are able to set up a continuity argument and say the L1 norm of our solution is controlled by this kind of right-hand side, right? An integral of the L1 norm times the plus the L1 norm squared. So this has many names, bihari lasalle inequality, nonlinear global inequality, continuity argument, but this gives you local local in time existence up to a possible blow up time. Okay, this is something. And the good thing is it allows us to show smoothness. So uh, we're using this L1 based symmetrized subolef spaces, right? So you have derivatives in both variables and moments in both variables, take L1 norm. If your spectrum is nice and you start with this kind of regularity, you keep this kind of regularity and you can take the the degree of regularity to infinity, if you start in Schwarz class, you are in Schwarz class. And if you are in Schwarz class, you get also time derivative, many time derivatives. So this is a bit more technical to show, but you can get it for a smooth problem. You have, you have smoothness. Smoothness is not destroyed until it possibly blow up. 
Uh, and also moments are not destroyed until possible blow up. So in principle, it's possible to compute this thing up to a possible blow up time. Okay, so now we have a we have a setting where we can trust that this object makes sense. Let's look at whether it's stable or unstable. So the first order of business is we linearize, we're trying to see is this term trying to grow the inhomogeneity or is it just uh, sitting still? Okay, so we, we write it in the mild form like before. So the, the solution of the linearized problem minus the free space solution is given by an integral like this. And now what's interesting here is you can integrate left and right, you can take the marginal in the k variable. So this, you just take the marginal, you get position density. This is an integral of known things. It doesn't matter how nice it might look. Uh, so, and here you have the position density only which does not depend on k. So all these other things are known things. So it's an integral of known things. So if you integrate in k, you get a Volterra equation of the second kind for the position density. So the position density minus the free space position density, what you would have if you were in free space, is given by this integral of this known integral kernel against the position density. And okay, this looks a bit messy and strange, this integral kernel, but it's a known, it's a known thing. And how do we solve the Volterra equation of the second kind? We take Laplace transforms, and by Laplace transform, you have this uh, apparently very simple solution. What is your position density in the Laplace domain? It's the transfer function times the position density in free space. Okay, so at this point, the idea should be very clear. As long as the transfer function doesn't have poles in the wrong place, that would create growth. So if this doesn't happen, then this is just a benign variation of the free space position density, and it inherits the dispersion of the free space position density. So how do we exclude this from creating a problem? You have a denominator. The denominator must not be zero. So you get a Penrose type stability condition. This is what they are called in plasmas, and they have exactly the same structure. So that's why I'm still calling it Penrose type stability condition. Uh, so under this condition, assuming that your transfer function is good, then you should be able to invert the Laplace transform and get nice properties. And what kind of properties would you get? So what it says here is you get back the, the free space position density. Um, obviously, uh, it, it, as is well known, kinetic equations, free space does not give you rapid uh, decay usually. You, you, there is a limit in what you can get, but you can get something that does disperse. The problem is, that both this object and this object have a jump on the imaginary axis. So you cannot take your contour of integration on the imaginary axis. So you're actually going to do a lot of work in order to get this picture to work. Okay, so let me summarize, let, let me present the main result. So if we start with a linearized equation, the main is, and, and the spectrum satisfies the Penrose stability condition because Ultimately, the spectrum is the only thing that appears in the stability condition. Uh, then the, the finding is that the derivative of the position density, its L2 space time norm, is bounded. So the position, the, the derivative of the position density is vanishing for a long time. So this doesn't say that the position density goes to zero. It doesn't say that in homogeneity goes to zero. It says that any uh, you know, any spatial derivative. So then homogeneity goes to something flat, to something constant. So it's, it's, it becomes homogeneous in, in long time. So under the stability condition, you have this, um, you have this like weak, weak uh, result, weak dispersion result, and you can build a wave operator. So let me mention very briefly, what we're doing here is not the usual way they do land down dumping in, in uh, Vlasov. And, there are advantages in what they do there. But what we do here, which is, again, a bit different, we don't require for any of this, we don't require a mean zero assumption for the initial condition. For, I mean, in the mean zero for the initial Wigner, so it would show up different for F. But there, there is a condition that tells you that the, the initial inhomogeneity carries no energy. The initial inhomogeneity takes energy from one place and moves it to the other place. 
That's a physical content. So if you are dealing with plasmas and you're saying the initial incomogeneity doesn't add charge, but takes charge from one place and puts to another, maybe that's physically very, you know, it should be like that. But in this case, if you say it cannot carry energy, it can only be an imperfect homogeneity, then it means that a small wave train which carries energy could completely destabilize your system. So we want to be able to carry, to, to work with homogeneities that carry energy. And the way we do it, we can, now obviously this is a linear Landau dumping result. I don't know if this can transfer to the non-linear case. This is one open question, but, and I think this also should be explored numerically as well, and it's, it's not well understood at all, but for this problem, you can have non-mean zero in homogeneities and still have Landau dumping, at least linear Landau dumping, and this is very significant for the physical problem in ocean waves. So just one more remark, we made this Gaussian assumption up there, so anybody can tell me at any point that you know, all this is for an approximate equation, it doesn't you know, I don't believe it that characterizes NLS and so on. So I'm not saying that this is a perfect characterization of NLS. I'm saying that if you do find Landau dumping, if you do find stability and things are not growing, this is a kind of compatibility condition for the Gaussian closure. So you are saying that the Gaussian, if you start being quasi Gaussian, it seems like you are staying quasi Gaussian. You are not breaking, right? So you are kind of justifying to an extent your assumption in the sense that if it was true originally, it, it seems that it's not being broken later if you do find stability. If you find instability, then I don't believe the Gaussian closure assumption because even if initially you are Gaussian, as soon as things start growing, you are no longer even Gaussian, right? So it's a surprising that it seems to work even in that case, as we'll see, but the way I see the, the stability, the Landau dumping is as justifying the Gaussian closure. Otherwise, uh, it's, a bit, uh, it's a bit arbitrary and it's a bit uh, unjustified. Okay, so let me go very quickly to the idea of the proof. We want to invert this. There are two tricks that come into play in order to be able to not require mean zero assumption. The first is you don't actually need the position density. You need the force. I'm using the terminology of Landau dumping now. What is the force? Is the spatial derivative of the position density. And because we are in a Fourier inverse, this means you multiply by capital X. And this is significant because there is some apparent singularity at X equals zero that now this now is removed. And you are saying, and also you, do, you want to solve for the difference from free space because free space does not have such a rapid decay itself. The difference from free space has a much faster decay than simply the, the solution. So it, it, it's much better if you solve for this. And then if you solve for this, like I said, there is a jump on the imaginary axis. You cannot put your Laplace inversion contour on the imaginary axis. So you put your Laplace inversion contour a little bit to the right of it if you have the stability condition. So uh, at real part of omega equals delta, and you get the integral, your Laplace inversion integral, and you get a small exponential growth delta, and then you're hoping, can I take delta tends to zero, and then I find something in here that hopefully has the gain time, and this simply becomes one and goes away. Can I do this? So to do this, you need to see these objects, right? What is the free space position density, and what is this integral kernel H, and now we've taken its Laplace transform, and uh, what are these things? So without, I think I started a bit slow, sorry for that, so without spending uh, too much time, these objects turn out to be Hilbert transforms. And so I was very encouraged this morning to hear some more Hilbert transforms. Uh, and we're going to, to see the, the jumps uh, quite a bit of the Hilbert transform. So obviously, because of the scaling, you have minus i. So in our case, the jump is along the imaginary axis, not along the real axis, but it's the same thing. Um, so these things are Hilbert transforms. And we are taking the limit of delta going to 0 uh, in this setting. So what happens when you take this limit? You have the sochotsky plemeli formula, and you get the signal transform. That is the real value Hilbert transform, the Hilbert transform, the real line, minus I identity. That's what you get when you take the limit. And so, OK, so we know how to take the limit. So then the limit of the integral is the integral of the limit, right? But then to do dominated convergence, we definitely need 
that the limit is L1. And that's the other trick, the other non-trivial trick that you need to do. You need that the limit is L1, but the limit includes Hilbert transforms. And, and so to do this, you need to show that the Hilbert transform of the divided difference of the spectrum with increment X, which X is the wave number, you need to do this for every wave number, is L1. And in general, Hilbert transforms are not L1. So that's why I think this was never done before, as far as I know, because people said, oh, we're going to do it. Uh, you know, Hilbert transforms are not L1. So it turns out this is not just a Hilbert transform. It's a Hilbert transform of a divided difference. So in fact, we can do something more because if you have a function of compact support and integral zero, then you can show that it's Hilbert transform is L1. And what we have in there is a divided difference. So we have a, a copy of the spectrum minus a translated copy of the spectrum over the increment. But the integral, you know, this is the spectrum minus the spectrum. The integral is zero by construction. And the only thing that's left is this being of compact support. This is not a problem, of course, you know, physically, frequency wave numbers that go to infinity are not relevant to those sun waves. It's, it's not a problem to cut it off. And then you can cut it off, and then you can justify taking the limit. And with some, you know, some technical work, you can show that indeed the, the position density is close to the free space position density in its qualitative behavior. Okay, so the other thing that so okay, that's that's the, the linear, that's the proof for linear Landau dam. The other thing that is even more interesting for ocean engineers, I mean ocean engineers don't care if you have rigorous proof, right? But they care if they can resolve the stability condition. Because for us mathematicians, it's completely satisfactory to say this is, a this is a stability condition. But if you have a spectrum from the field, how do you test it? And if you are being simplistic about it, let's say, you say, well, the, easy, the most obvious way to violate this is to have some x star and some omega star so that h of x star omega star is equal to 1. OK. This is a nonlinear equation you can try to solve. This is its complex value. So it's really two nonlinear equations in three unknowns because omega is also complex, you have real and imaginary parts. And you need to guarantee the existence or not of solutions. And this is not easy. So, okay, since I started slow, I will have to go a bit fast before a bit fast now. But the point here is you can actually so the following are equivalent. So violating the stability condition. Either you have a solution, like I showed before, A of x star omega star equals one. So in this normalization, 4p, something, if you if you take this and you put it on the on the left hand side is one, it's a normalization question. And there is a special case, what happens if omega is real is, is a bit different. So there, there is some fine print, but that's not important. But the point is this is not constructive. This is not easy to solve. And this was one of the main reasons or one of the main limitations that ocean engineers show in the Albert equation. In principle, we like the idea, but how do we test this? And so what we are able to do, okay, we, 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 we reformulate it to a constructive test. So let me go a bit fast here. So basically you need to test all wave numbers for stability. For every wave number, you draw a curve in the complex plane, which is simply, the signal transform of the divided difference of the spectrum. And you take T from minus infinity to infinity, and this you just draw where is, what is the value that you find on the complex plane. So for T going to minus infinity, obviously the value goes to zero. For T going to plus infinity, the value goes to zero. And everywhere in between, you get some values in between. So you choose your capital X, your wave number capital X, and you get a curve like this. And then the theorem is, if you have the specified real number here, if this real number is inside the curve, you are unstable. If the real number, if the if this wave number is unstable, and we will give rise to an unstable mode. Uh, so in general, you would have some unstable wave numbers, and some would be stable. And if the, for larger and larger wave numbers, the curves shrink, so you don't need to check huge wave numbers. The interesting thing is. Uh, is, is really around the around wave number zero. So this is really reminds of modulation stability. But you can have a spectrum where all wave numbers are stable. And in fact, this is what happens in the vast majority of cases. 
And in that case, uh, it's a stable spectrum, right? That you satisfy the stability condition. Okay, so this was from a practical point of view, being able to use this theory, this was a huge, um, a huge step forward, right? Because now you have a MATLAB code and you know, in, in one minute, you can test the spectrum for stability or not. While before it was this uh, existential thing, there exists tape, there exists a state. Okay, so I'm showing here how some typical spectral look. This is a parametric spectrum. It's called John Schwab. It has parameters alpha and gamma. Alpha is just a multiplicative constant. So higher alpha, larger spectrum, larger area under the curve, more power. Gamma is a peakiness parameter. So high gamma looks with a high peak, low gamma looks with a lower peak. And what, of course, if you if you if you take alpha going to infinity, it's going to become unstable eventually. But it's much more sensitive to gamma. So what really determines stability is how peaked it is for its power, given its power, its the significant wave height corresponds to. So we said, okay, let's take a large data set and apply this apply this uh, stability uh, condition to. So these blue stars are measured sea states from the North Atlantic. There are 100,000 measured sea states. And the people at the DNV, what they do, they measure, you know, uh, okay, whatever they have about its sea state, they convert, they fit a John Sharp spectrum to that. So they say, okay, for these measurements, the best representation is a John Sharp spectrum with alpha equals 0.1, and gamma equals three. Some, they have a recipe, they know how to do this. So what you're seeing here is the alpha gamma play. Gamma, if you're going to the right, it's more peaked, more likely to be unstable. And alpha, as you go up, is more power, more likely to be unstable. Now you see that the vast majority of, of C states, almost all, like 80% of the time, is with alpha equals one. So they are not particularly peaked, and the, the power can range over you know, three orders of magnitude almost, but that's it. Now, as you start to go, these are already high power seas. These are already storms, basically. As you start going to larger and larger storms, higher alpha almost monotonously means higher gamma. And this is, this is known to be so. That there's an explanation for this. If there is strong wind blowing for a long time, it's going to create a, a, a narrow band spectrum. This is going to create a huge, huge waves, but they're going to be narrow when they're created. So larger storms have larger alpha and larger gamma, and they're going rapidly towards unstable region. And these are the most extreme storms they have measured, and they have cut off the gamma. Just like here, they, they simply refuse to put gamma smaller than one. Everything has, So the smallest gamma we're going to use is one. Here, they have cut off the gamma at five. Some people cut it off at six or, or, or something like that, but the point is they, 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 you have to cut it off, right? Even if your statistics tell you put 11, you don't put 11. Okay, so uh, as you go up here, you have this thing. Now, what are, what are the lines? So the blue stars are C states. For every C state, we have how many, what's the likelihood of meeting this state if you pick a random time of the year and the random space in the North Atlantic. What's the likelihood to land on this state? We have the likelihoods. But what are these lines? So the red line and the blue line here are lines proposed as separatrices for the stable and unstable region. And they were a bit, a bit crude, a bit ad hoc, and a bit based on some gen broad scaling arguments. So these are what the order of magnitude of the physics suggests. And as you see, they're quite good. So in some regime, the blue line is very good. In some regime, the red line is a bit better. And they're not that far from each other. But the black line is what we get by analyzing the, um, the John Schwab spectra with this algorithm that I showed before. So like I said, some regions, blue is better. Some regions, red is better. And we find actually the real life problem has quite a bit of tolerance. So for, for high gamma, it goes a bit higher before you actually Heat instability, but there are C states that are measured that are modulationally unstable. Uh, and this to me was very was very interesting because it shows that indeed this kind of analysis, you know, it scales with the physical problem, right? It's not, it's not like everything is stable, it's not like everything is unstable. 
this kind of behavior would be consistent with wrong waves being actually related to this kind of modulation stability. It happens 0.2% of the time. Now, where does this 0.2% of the time figure come from? If you add the likelihood of all the blue stars in the unstable region, is 0.2%, which is broadly very reasonable with empirical know-how, with empirical uh, understanding of statistics of wrong waves. So there are sea states where something different happens and you have to attack like that. You have to consider in the nonlinear setting. Okay, so the, there is some more work. You don't have to work with parametric spectra. Here I'm showing some curves from a non-parametric spectrum uh, that we're also working with odin Gramstad. So you can take measured spectra that are not parametric. They look a bit messier. So the curves are a bit messier. They may self-intersect, but the analysis is the same. Nothing changes. Uh, and something that was also, uh, that's also, I think is very interesting is we can quantify stability because not all stable C states are the same. And once you see this approach, you say, okay, the curve didn't reach the target, fine. But is it the same if it reads 90% of the way or if it reads 10% of the way? Shouldn't there be a difference? So we create this non-dimensional proximity to instability which simply measures the distance from the target, that what is left uh, from the target. And then you say, how does this compare with the distance of the target from zero? So how close did we come? So in this case, this spectrum came about halfway close to being unstable, right? So you do have proximity to stability, 0.5. If it came 90% close, you would say proximity to stability is, um, uh, you are 90 percent all the way up to instability so we're doing this and we are asking are the, the spectra that are stable but closer to being unstable are they more likely to generate extreme events so uh, odin put a uh, monte carlo solver a uh, monte carlo simulation he started with a uh, with a spectra we're analyzing 100 spectra non-parametric from the north atlantic 90 chose at random as a control group 10 chosen for their severity 10 severe storms uh, and then he's generating a number of initial conditions from its uh, power spectrum and then simulating a uh, high order spectral method. So not on NLS, uh, he's simulating on a broadband solver, uh, fully numerically, no, no assumptions um, of the nature needed in NLS and Gaussian closure and, and, and all that. And he just records extreme waves according to the standard definition of rock waves of wave height larger than twice the significant wave height. And that's what we found. So if we do the scatter diagram of if I take the spectrum, my compute proximity to instability, and if he let it, lets it run for 10 hours, the equivalent of 10 hours uh, real time, and measures how many, what's the, so if we do for many initial conditions, what's the probability that I, that I see a rogue wave there? Uh, you see that the rogue wave probability varies from 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 2. So varies over two orders of magnitude. So that's a lot, right? It's not almost, it's not the same. But uh, the, the, uh, you yes. have a couple of minutes. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, but the point is that proximity to instability correlates quite well with this. And in fact, the things that we that are a bit off are spectra that are closer to being bimodal and don't fit so well in the narrow band consideration so okay stable um uh, stable spectra can still be closer to unstable so uh, so although the the background spectrum doesn't necessarily reach the point of feeding the homogeneity it doesn't let it disperse as fast in some cases that's one way to talk about this okay so let me make sure i don't go over time uh, this was extremely surprising for us but we we had fun at some point we said Let's say we have an unstable spectrum. Let's take the unstable modes and let's combine, take a linear combination of unstable modes, let them grow in time until they become comparable to the background and see what it looks like. And we put this figure in this engineering paper in 2017 that if this analysis is correct, until it starts to emerge at least, then that's what a, a, a rock wave should look like for an unstable spectrum. And one year later, the Matthijs Grafke and Van den Eyden, they did a full numer fully numerical paper. They used Monte Carlo uh, and something they call large deviation theory. They didn't even use NLS. They used a more sophisticated equation, but they, they found, they reported 
a universal profile for rock waves. So to me, this was surprising. I, I, I didn't necessarily believe that what we do here is uh, justified, but um, it seems there is a universal profile of rock waves and maybe it, 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 it's, it, to an extent it is described by the unstable modes of the spectra. And for this, to get this shape, it was important to stop at the correct time scale because if you keep evolving it longer, it, it changes quite a bit. And we stopped when the, the inhomogeneity started to become comparable with the background. So this highlights the issue of time scales because the physical problem has time scales. If you need 3,000 years to see a wave, you are not going to see a wave. Um, and this comes in how you interpret the results. So, okay, let me not let me not say anything about this. So, okay, thanks very much for your patience. Uh, my point here was to present the Albert equation. It's you can look at it as a fresh take on, on NLS, a different aspect, a different point of view on NLS, which poses new problems and has opportunities with respect to real life applications. Um, there is a bifurcation. You can be either stable or unstable. You don't have to have only modulation stability. What happens if you have a stable spectrum and you put a large inhomogeneity? Because nonlinear Landau damping only applies to small enough inhomogeneity. So Landau damping is not so different from modulation stability, actually. It's not completely different. And still something, still you can excite this kind of patterns for large enough inhomogeneity. So, Many open questions in Landau damping correlate with questions in modulation stability. Uh, we can think about deterministic versions of this analysis, like uh, initial conditions in quasi-periodic functions or something like that. And of course, there is a lot of numerical work to be done here that I think uh, would be a lot of fun. And just a, just a quick uh, remark that 2D fully broadman versions of this are possible. They are much more tedious but you can do crossing Cs, you can do all sorts of broad spectra, non-parametric, non-narrow band. And this is more relevant to the applications, of course, it's the same ideas, but with more to use. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Ahis. Let's thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, I have a very general question. Do I understand correctly somewhat your general message that uh, NLS is just sufficient to describe everything in ocean, including John Swap spectrum, just some fitting, and you get everything? Okay, I understand it's a so, very general question, but. Okay, so no, uh, that's not quite uh, my message. Um, my message is that, so the, the main limitations of NLS are that it's narrow band. So uh, narrow, okay. So if you have narrow band, the way it turns out is it's more is more relevant if you have two peaks in your spectrum, even if they're relatively close. If you have two peaks and you do NLS versus a half, let's say, you get very different results after a while. Because, and this is easy to see, because for NLS, you have to choose your K0, and your K0 is in a very high power. So if your K0 is even a little bit off, you'll get different results. So if you have a well-defined central wave number, and that's not in question, and some reasonable decay around it, uh, then it, it's reasonable in one D, in one D. So if you have crossing Cs, forget about it, NLS cannot do it. And if you have multiple peaks, which you often have in realistic spectra, NLS cannot do it. And then there is a question of time scales. Of course, NLS has a long time behavior and it doesn't mean that it's the same, right? For the long time, like really, really long time, you would need to bad breaking, for example, and things like that. Uh, but for time scale of a few wave periods in unidirectional, reasonably narrow band and unimodal spectra, yes, NLS is good. And the people who work with numbers and data, they know that, and that's why they use NLS. And but if you think see, John Swap, is John Swap can be described by NLS or not? Yes, yes. Okay, your message is yes. Okay. So thank you. Thank yes, you. with with a qualification because John Swap is cleanly cleanly unimodal. Okay, it, the, the questions are you know for for how long and what kind of computational domain, 
uh, I'm not saying absolutely everything with every dose of spectrum is perfect, right? I'm not saying that. But yes, usually, I, I, usually it's, it's okay, yes. Thank you. So, uh, since we are running a little late, uh, maybe uh, if there are questions, maybe ask uh, directly to Ahis. So we'll move on to the final speaker of the morning, who is uh, Ted Johnson from uh, uh, University College London. Well, I've got, uh, I think, three groups of people I should thank. First of all, I should thank you all for being here this morning after such a 